for those of you watching, thank you again for uh, spending uh, some, some time out of your Sunday to check us out on our live stream. If you're watching this later on or hearing the recording, um, I hope that uh, after this service you will have been blessed and your life will have been changed. And I've titled today's message, David's Final Song and Valiant Warriors. And we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And as you're churning there, um, I want to just mention that last week when we looked at David's Thanksgiving psalm, his song from the heart, um, David had looked back at the mercy and the faithfulness of God during his life and his reign. Well, now in this first part of 2 Samuel chapter 23 um, that we're going to be covering today, David will be looking ahead. He's going to be looking ahead, trusting in the promises God has given him. So what I've done this morning to make things a little easier is I've broken this down also into two sections. I'll be reading the uh, the first part of 2 Samuel 23, and then afterwards the rest of the chapter. So before we begin reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, as, um, as our dear brother and pastor Isaac mentioned, Lord, we are so thankful that you brought us here, that you've given us this time of, of worship, um, and I pray that it was just enjoyable to you, Lord. Um, our hearts uh, belong to you. We want them to just be totally dedicated to you right now, Lord. Um, so speak to us right now loudly, powerfully, as we get into your word. Lord, uh, we know that your word is life. It gives life. And so now may again go out powerfully among those that are here and those that are watching live or maybe watching or hearing this later on at a later time. So move powerfully here now, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Protect us. And may we just look to you now. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. And the word of God says, these are the last words of David, a declaration of David, son of Jesse, the declaration of the man raised on high, the one anointed by the God of Jacob. This is the most delightful of Israel's songs. The spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, the one who rules the people with justice, who rules in, in the fear of God, is like the morning light when the sun rises on a cloudless morning, the, gliss, the glisten of rain on sprouting grass. Is it not true my house is with God? For he has established a permanent covenant with me, ordered and secured in every detail. He will not bring about my whole salvation and my every desire, but all the wicked are like thorns raked aside. They can never be picked up by hand. The man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear. They will be completely burned up on the spot. Now, in case you weren't aware of this, at least 73 of the Psalms in the book of Psalms were, uh, well, David's given the credit for them as, as the author of those Psalms. But his last one is the only one found in the first seven verses of this chapter. In these last words of his, David is speaking as a prophet who is delivering a divine word from the Lord. 
It's also believed that he may have written it towards the end of his life, shortly before his death. Now, since the theme of this psalm is godly leadership, one of the things that he probably has in mind as he wrote it was his son Solomon. But it also has much to say of all of God's people today. Well, the inspired king begins this psalm by speaking of the privileges of leadership. Now, most of David's poems point out his utter amazement, his complete awe that God would call him to become king, to lead God's people and fight his battles. And he, would, he was even odd that he would use him to write God's word. Now, from a human perspective, David was a nobody, a shepherd, the youngest of eight sons in an ordinary Jewish family. Nevertheless, God selected him and made him become Israel's greatest king. The Lord spent 30 years training David, first with the sheep in the pastures, then with Saul in the army camp, and finally with his own fighting men in the Judean wilderness. Throughout that time, the Lord had given David skillful hands, a heart of integrity, and equipped him to know and to do his will. And so when he finally stepped onto the throne to lead, he already knew that he didn't have to promote himself to achieve greatness. And so the principle here is that great leaders, amazing leaders, are trained in private before they go to work in public. Someone once said, that talents are best matured in solitude. Character is best formed in the stormy billows of the world. And well, David had both. He had been faithful in private as a servant. So God was able to elevate him publicly to be a ruler. The Lord followed the same procedure when he prepared Moses, Joshua, Nehemiah, the apostles, and yes, even his own son. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say, it is a tragic thing when a young man succeeds before he's ready for it. Well, David was ready for the throne. Another principle in all this is that God empowers those he calls and anoints them with his spirit. A.W. Tozer said, Never follow any leader until you see the oil on his forehead, which, is ex- which explains why so many gifted men came to David and joined his band. See, it takes more than talent and training to be an effective leader and to be able to recruit and train other leaders. Jesus reminded his disciple, and he reminds us as well, in John chapter 15, verse 5, that you can do nothing without me. Religious leaders who follow the principles of what the world calls success rarely accomplish anything permanent that glorifies God. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, the one who does the will of God remains forever. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's good to be educated by men, but I believe it's even more important, above all that, to be trained by the Lord. So many people pastors, leaders out there who are serving in ministry go to, go to seminary, yet they're not being trained 
by the Lord. So it's important that you be trained by the Lord. That's how he teaches you. That's how he taught David cleaning up the sheep poop in the sheep pen. Our Lord was 30 years preparing for three years of service, wrote Oswald Chambers. The modern stamp is three hours of preparation for 30 years of service. But the Spirit not only empowered David for battle, he also inspired him to write beautiful psalms that still minister to our hearts. When you think about the trials that David had to endure in order to give us these psalms, it makes you appreciate them even more. David was clear that he was writing the Word of God, not just religious poetry. In Acts chapter 2, verse 30, Peter called David a prophet. In Acts chapter 2, verse 24 to 36, at Pentecost, he quoted what David wrote about the Messiah's resurrection and ascension. So you see, when you read the Psalms, you're not only reading the, the Word of God, but you're also learning about the Son of God. Now, in verses 3 to 7, David speaks on the responsibility of leadership. God didn't train David just to put him on display. No, he trained him because he had important work for him to do. And so it is with every true leader. See, David was to rule over God's people. That was the plan. The sheep of God's pasture, which is an awesome responsibility. It demands character and integrity and a submissive attitude toward the Lord without righteousness and the fear of God. A leader becomes a dictator and abuses God's people, driving them like cattle instead of leading them like sheep. David was a ruler who served and a servant who ruled. And he had the welfare of his people on his heart. Verses 4 to 7, David used a beautiful metaphor to picture the work of the leader. Rain and sunshine that together produce useful fruit instead of painful thorns. David exemplified this principle in his own life. For when he came to the throne, it meant that a dawning of a new day for the nation of Israel. With the coronation of David, the storms that Saul had caused in the land were now over, and the light and the light of God's countenance was shining on his people. Under David's leadership, there would be harvest. There would be a harvest of blessing from the Lord. With God's help, leaders must create such a creative atmosphere that their co-leaders will be able to grow and produce fruit. So if any of you have a desire, have a heart to lead or to, to just be part of a ministry and one day lead, whether it's a women's ministry, whether it's kids ministry, whether it's a clean, a cleaning ministry, it could be any kind of ministry. But if you want to lead that ministry and God calls you to it, then know this, ministry involves both sunshine and rain, clear days and cloudy days. But a godly leader's ministry will produce gentle rain that brings life, not destructive storms. Friends, believe me when I tell you that how great it feels to follow a spiritual leader who will bring out the best in you and helps you to produce 
fruit for the glory of God. Unspiritual leaders only produce thorns that irritate people and make progress very, very hard. And maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. Well, in verse 5, David went beyond the principle of leadership to celebrate the coming of the Messiah. There, David mentioned the covenant of the Lord uh, that he had made with him in 2 Samuel chapter 7. A covenant that guaranteed him a dynasty forever and a throne forever. A covenant that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In his first question, there he asks, Is it not true my house is with God? Now, in no way does this suggest that all of David's children were godly, because we know, as we've covered 2 Samuel, that this wasn't the case at all. Not all of them were. It only declares that David's house, his dynasty, was secure because of God's covenant promises. And see, nothing at all could ever change this covenant. It was everlastingly secured by the character of God. In the second part of verse 5, David asks another question. Will he not bring about my whole salvation and my every desire? David's desire was that God would fulfill his promises and send the Messiah, who would be born out of his own household, out of his own descendants. Now, historically, the throne of Judah ended in 586 B.C. with the reign of Zedekiah. But that, doesn't, but, but that wasn't the end of David's family or the nation of Israel. The Lord providentially preserved Israel and David's seed so that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. The nation was small and weak, but the Messiah came just the same. Didn't matter. It says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from its roots will bear fruit. However, David says in our text here in verses 6 and 7, that one day the evil people of the earth will be uprooted like thorns and burned. Like thorns. They were not only useless, but dangerous, choking the growth of all that is good. And Jesus spoke about this in one of his parables in Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 7 and 22. So in the light of God's word to him, David saw clearly in his old age how people's destiny becomes polarized either for or against God. Like a rope being pulled in opposite directions until it's down to its final thread, this polarization will one day reach its limit and that final thread will break. And so the final, verse of, the final two verses of this psalm describe when that happens, when that rope breaks, and Christ's judgment on the sons of rebellion, those who disobeyed, those that didn't want to listen, those who refused to accept Him as Savior, the sons of rebellion, uh, their judgment is going to be on them when He returns to set up His kingdom. These were the final words of David. You can tell that even at his old age, he just wanted to obey God. He was in love with God. He just, that was all the only thing on his mind. He was also looking forward, knowing that one day, out of his own seed, out of his own family, the Messiah would come and bring salvation. Well, now let's 
move on to the last part of Second Samuel chapter 23. I tried practicing one of all these, some of these names, but if you know me by now, you'll know I'll, I'm going to be butchering some of them. So um, I do make an effort to try to practice, but I don't know, my brain kind of sometimes doesn't work right. Okay, well, anyways, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. These are the names of David's warriors. Josheb, Bashabeth, the Tahachemite, the Tahachemite, the was chief of the officers. He wielded his spear against 800 men that he killed at one time. After him, Eleazar, son of Dodo, son of Ahohite, uh, son of an Ahohite, was among the three warriors with David when they defied the Philistines. The men of Israel retreated in the place they had gathered for battle. But Eliezer stood his ground and attacked the Philistines until his hand was tired and stuck to his sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Then the troops came back to him, but only to plunder the dead. After him was Shema, son of Aji, the Haraite. The Philistines had assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils. The troops fled from the Philistines, but Shama took his stand in the middle of the field, defended it, and struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Three of the 30 leading warriors went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam while a company of Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in a stronghold and a Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David was extremely thirsty and said, if only someone would bring me water to drink from the well at the city gate of Bethlehem. So the three, so three of the warriors broke through the Philistine camp and drew water from the well at the gate of Bethlehem. They brought it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. David said, Lord, I would never do such a thing. It is not, is this not the blood of men who risk their lives? So he refused to drink it. Such were the exploits of the three warriors. Abishai, Joab's brother, and son of Zeruiah was leader of the three. He wielded his spear against 300 men and killed them, gaining a reputation among the three. Was he not more honored than the three? He became their commander, even though he did not become one of the three. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, Jehoiada was the son of a brave man from Kabzeel, a man of many exploits. Benaniah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He also killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went down to him with a club, snatched the spear out of, Egypt, out of the Egyptian's hand, and then killed him with his own spear. These were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, who had a reputation among the three warriors. He was the most honored of the thirty but it did not become one of the three. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Among the 30 were Joab's brother Asahel, El Elanan, son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shama, the Herodite, Elka, the Harodite, Helez, the Pal Paltite, Ira, the son of Ikesh, the Teko Tekoite, Ab Abiezer, the Ano Anothathite, Mebunai, the Hushatite, Zalman, the Ahotite, the Ahohite, Maharai, Netophathite, Heleb, son of Bana, the Netophite, Itai, the son of Rebai, from Gibeah of the Benjamites, Benaniah, the Parathonite, he died from the wadis of Gash. Ibu Abi Alban, the Arbathite, Asmapheth, the Baharamite, 
Ilileba the Shalbanite, the sons of Jashin, Jonathan, son of Shama, the Heratite, Herarite, Ahim, son of Sharar, the Hararite, Elphilet, son of Abishai, Abishai, Abashbai, son of Mac, Macathite, Eliam, son of Ahuthiphil, the Galenite, Hezro, the Carmelite, Pariah, Parai, the Arbite, Egal, son of Nathan from Zobah, Benai, the Gadite, Zelek, the Mennonite, Naharai, the Beerothite, the armor bearer for Joab, son of Zerurah, Ira, the Ithrite, Gerab, the Ithrite, and Uriah, the Hithite. There were 37 in all. It's a challenge to get through. Um, but it's important, again, I, I totally believe that uh, reading God's Word, even if it's a list of names, it is God's Word. It needs to, it needs to be uttered, it needs to be said, it needs to be declared. Um, what we just read is a catalog of David's mighty men. What's significant, though, about this list is that Joab, the commander of David's army, isn't mentioned or honored at all. If I had to guess, I'd say it was because of the way he unjustifiably and mercilessly killed Absalom, Abner, and Amasa. And furthermore, 1 Kings chapter 2 Verse 28 to 34 tells how Joab was disloyal to David and tried to put Adonijah to, on the throne. And as a result, it cost him his life. In any case, this last list is, the, is near the end of David's reign. While there's a parallel list in, in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, um, and there, that list is placed in the beginning. And although it's not identical, there are great similarities between the two lists, but more information about these men is given there in First Chronicles chapter 11. However, for now, I'll try to share um, as much as I can uh, what the Bible tells us about these men. And so, again, it tells us at the end of verse 39 that this gallery of David's heroes, his valiant men, consisted of 37. 37 men. These were great warriors from his elite troops who distinguished themselves by their extraordinary exploits in service to God and Israel. They consisted of three chief men, two others of a second rank, and the 32 in the longest list. As I mentioned, Joab isn't mentioned, but his brothers, Abishai and Asahel, were listed there in verse 8 and 24. Now, even though the spellings of several of these names do look a little bit different in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, they're pretty much, they're the same people. Um, so the first three were mentioned in verses 8 through 11, along with their notable achievements. First uh, Samuel 22 says that these three also displayed their courage by obtaining water from Bethlehem for David while he was besieged in the summer, the harvest time, by the Philistines in Adullam. And David was so moved by what, their, what they did, their, value that, their valor that they showed, that he refused to drink the water, but poured it out as an offering to the Lord. Included in the second rank was Abishai, son of Zerurai, who I said was Joab's brother, and also he was nephew of David. And he was chief of the second three, but not as exalted as the first three previously listed, as well as Benaniah who achieved notable victories over both men and a lion. There, 
the longest list consists of 32 men. Now, as I mentioned, besides Joab's two brothers, there's another name that may look familiar to you, and that's Uriah the Hittite, the husband, the former husband of Bathsheba. Now, we know from the story that David had him killed in battle, but here his memory was honored by being listed along with the other great warriors. Now, there are two facts that are worth noting here. First, David didn't do the job alone. He had the, he had the help of many, many devoted followers. We think of David and his mighty, as a mighty warrior, and he was. He definitely was, but how far would he have gotten without his loyal and gifted leaders or his soldiers? Most of the men listed came from Judah. This is to be accept, uh, expected since Judah was David's tribe and he reigned there before the nation was united. But the 30 also included men from Benjamin, the tribe of Saul, and several soldiers from neighboring nations. All these men recognized that God's hand was upon David. They wanted to be part of what God was doing. The diversity of the commanders in his army also speaks well of his leadership. Now, uh, the other fact worth noting here is that uh, God noted each man, had most of their names, um, and had most of their names recorded in his word, and will one day reward each one for the ministry they performed. David's name is mentioned over a thousand times here in the Bible, while most of these men are mentioned but once or twice. However, in the end, when all is said and done, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says that when they meet the Lord, then, then praise will come to each one from God. And you know who else had mighty men and women? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He took note of them just as surely as David took note of those who valiantly served him. So let me tell you this. Regardless of your rank, fight the good fight of faith. He will honor you too on that glorious day when you meet him face to face. Now, as I close now, as I bring this all together, I want to share with you some of the lessons ancient, uh, ancient Israelites had learned and what us as contemporary Christians should learn from. First, the author here is reminding us of the principle of plurality, plurality, which is this. This is the principle of plurality. I can't see that right now. Um, what God has done through David, he also accomplished through others. What God has done through David, he also accomplished through others. One commentator put it this way. Yahweh, the warrior, trained, strengthened, and gave victory on the battlefield to his anointed David. But he did not limit this treatment to David. Other soldiers of the covenant, such as Eliezer, could also experience this divine blessing. So you see, there's a tendency to suppose that God limits himself to one person through whom he accomplishes much. In the New Testament, this one-man mentality is thoroughly refuted. The church is the body of Christ, composed of those Jews and Gentiles who are in Christ through faith, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 and 22 says that 
each member of the body has a unique function which they carry out by means of their spiritual gift or gifts. So what I'm saying here is that no one should think of themselves, no one at all, anyone serving in the church should ever think of themselves as independent to the rest of the body. Paul also said earlier in in verses 14 through 19 of that same chapter that no one should think of themselves as non-essential, as not important. The reality is that that person throwing out that trash, that person cleaning the restrooms is just as important as anyone standing on this pulpit or any pulpit or in standing in front of a classroom or leading a men's study or a women's study. There is, everyone is just as important who serves in the church. So while there are many willing to accept the plurality principle of the, uh, from the New Testament times onward, there are some who are predisposed to think that the Old Testament was a one-man show. But I would beg to differ. God divided responsibility for leading Israel among the prophets, the priests, and the kings. He didn't concentrate all power in one office or one man. Indeed, this is where Saul got himself into serious trouble when he usurped Samuel's role in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and refused to wait for him and then proceeded to offer the sacrifices that he wasn't supposed to be given. That was... Uh, Samuel's role. That was his job. Also, in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah mistakenly thought that he was, that he was, uh, he alone was left. There was no one else around. He was alone. When this was the furthest from the truth. See, God works through a plurality of people to achieve his purposes. He isn't restricted to one person or to even a few. He uses his people to accomplish his, his purpose. He uses his you, he uses you, he uses me, he uses Isaac, Sam, like everybody to accomplish his purposes. And that's what he's going to do here with this church. I totally believe that as well. A second lesson we can learn from this is that courage, like cowardice, is contagious. Have you ever wondered why when we read about Saul, we don't find any mention of such mighty men of valor? As I read the account of Saul's leadership over Israel, he was dependent upon mercenaries. There there don't seem to be Groups similar to David's three and his 30. So why not? I would suggest that Saul lacked the courage of David and the ability to attract and inspire mighty men of valor. For example, when Goliath mocked the people of Israel and their God, we don't see Saul stepping forward to silence him nor do we find any of his followers willing to do the same. When Saul shrunk back from the challenges, so did his men. They seemed more likely to desert him and to stand tall. But David, but David was a man of courage. When a lion or a bear threatened his father's flock, he refused to allow any losses. He went after it, he made sure that his sheep were protected. He killed the bear and the lion. When Goliath blasphemed the name of God, David did battle with him and killed him. David constantly proved himself to be a man of courage. Is it then any wonder why he attracted like-minded men? 
the man who stood up to Goliath was surrounded with courageous men who would gladly take on Goliath's descendants. See, ladies and gentlemen, courage inspires courage. And David was a man of courage. Again, no wonder we find so many heroes among those closest to him. Same is true today. Too many, too many, too often the people of God are intimidated by faint hearted leaders who aren't willing to trust God and are frightened by any hint of opposition or adversity. What many churches in America need today, as always, is a company of mighty men and women of valor through whom God will do great things and through whom God will inspire others as well. Third lesson. Our text tells us a lot about uh, the measure of a great man or woman of God. Now, allow me to summarize some of the characteristics of the mighty man and woman of valor apparent that are apparent in our text, our text. Heroes are not just known by the body count. Yes, it's true that our text, uh, our text uh, measures, uh, does measure the greatness uh, in, in terms of how many people the person killed. But there are other measures. There are many other measure, measures, as I will try to show you or point out. But let me begin by stressing that the body count method of measuring success is not very applicable, uh, applicable to us as Christians today. The Israelites of David's day were constantly at war with their enemies, and success was measured by the number that were killed, their enemies that were killed. Today, we're engaged in spiritual warfare, which does not require us to kill our opponents. I sometimes wonder if some Christians have realized this. Heroes emerge in a time of crisis. The men who are honored here in our list, in our text, were not looking for fame. They simply refused to give in when things got tough. Difficult days challenge us to step up to the plate and to be counted among the mighty men of history. Heroes emerge when others fear and fail. Notice that in several instances, the mighty men of David and of God stood firm at the very, at the very time when others fled in fear. When the sun, when the hearts of some are growing faint, the hearts of mighty men and women grow strong in faith and courage. Heroes Ladies and gentlemen, aren't afraid to stand alone as David did before Goliath and as his followers did also. Heroes have been prepared and predisposed to their heroism by their way of life. I have previously emphasized that heroes emerge in times of crisis. This is true, but there is a preparation which has gone before this those who stand fast in times of crisis are those who have learned to trust and obey in normal times of life heroism is there before the crisis arrives but it becomes evident in the time of crisis heroes aren't frightened by the odds which appear striked uh, stacked against them Put differently, heroes are willing to live dangerously and to trust God by assuming certain risks. For example, here, Jonathan was a mighty man. And it is, it's no wonder that he uh, was uh, so fond of David. When Saul and his men were faint of heart, frightened by the large number of Philistines who opposed him, Jonathan 
Saul's son pursued, went in pursuit of the enemy and said this to his armor bearer in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. Come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing will keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So do you see, David's mighty men weren't as impressed with statistics as they were with standing firm, trusting in God in the victory. Heroes are willing to die if need be. The heroes of the Bible were men who trusted in God. These men and women were not afraid to die because their faith was directed Godward and toward the heavenly kingdom. A man who is afraid of death is not one who is willing to live dangerously and to take risks. Heroes work hard, work and train very hard. But in the end, they look to God for victory. Heroes take their duties and responsibilities seriously. As soldiers, these men were required to stand their ground and fight. And fight they did. Even when others fled, they stood fast. There's a strong commitment. There's a strong sense of commitment to duty evident in these mighty men. In these mighty men. Heroes go above and beyond the call of duty out of faith, loyalty, and love. The best illustration of this act of the best illustration of this is David's um, three men who fetched him a drink from the well at Bethlehem. David didn't command them to go do that, to go get him that drink. If he had done so, then they had died or, and they had obeyed, it would have been their duty. But David merely just mentioned it under his breath. He merely just kind of haphazardly just mentioned it. Man, I'm thirsty. I'm dying of thirst. And for them, his wish was their command. They risked their lives, fought their way to the well and back, all out of loyalty and love for David. See true heroes seek to do that which pleases those in authority over them. They aren't compelled by their duty. They're not only compelled by their duty, but also by their desire to please the one they serve. Heroes emerge where, where heroism is modeled, valued, and rewarded. Again, this, what the, that's what these men saw with David. Heroes are those who have had the courage, who had the courage to identify themselves with God's anointed. I'm reminded that these mighty men are David's mighty men. These are men who stood with David and for David, not just when the going was easy and when it was po the popular thing to do, but when the going got tough and, and standing with David put one in harm's way. They still stuck with him. In the book, in the book of Hebrews, it seems to me that one of the ways saints showed themselves to be heroes was to identify with Christ and with his church when it was dangerous to do so. These are the days where heroism is needed. It's no longer popular or safe to be known as a Christian. There is, in my opinion, no moral majority who will applaud Christians for their faith and obedience to the word of God. We may well find some professing Christians fainting when times get tough. We may have to stand alone at work, at school, and even in the family. David was a hero, a mighty man of val valor, as were, the, as were the men named in our text. But let us remember who the greatest hero was who ever lived. Our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is he who is the source of our courage and faith. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says this, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What man can, what can man do to me? I'm not so sure heroism is so readily apparent today. Not because there are any fewer heroes, but because true acts of heroism may not be so self-evident as a great pile of bodies would have been in David's day. It may well be that the, great, that the greater members of the body of our Lord, the church, are those who are hardly visible, while those in the spotlight may not be as important as we, or worse yet, they think. As I understand the Bible, there will come a time when every Christian will stand before the throne of God and all our thoughts and deeds will be judged. What a joy and privilege it would be to have him say to us, to you, to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's close in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for these final words of David, for this poem, for this song that he wrote, Lord. And we also thank you for giving us this list of courageous men that we can look to as, as examples and how to live a, a faithful, courageous Christian life, Lord. Lord, we, we desire to honor you in everything that we say and do. So give us the strength to do so, Lord, even when we feel weak, even when we feel incompetent, even when we feel like we're not good enough, Lord. Remind us. Remind those who are having our time that what you've done for them, they are redeemed, they're forgiven, that death no longer has a reign on them, Lord. No longer has him shack shackled. Lord. And they will receive a greater reward than anything this world will ever offer them, Lord. And for those of you who have never surrendered your life to Jesus and have never made him your Lord and Savior, never been born again, and would like to now receive Jesus into your heart, be forgiven of your sins. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to do so. And so wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Now fill me, Lord. Fill me to the brim with your Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and strengthen me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, please reach out to us, send us a comment or in the comment section and let us know how we can reach out to you too. Maybe we can send you a Bible and, and help you in your next steps as a Christian. Um, you're not alone. Many people do care about you and we want to help you maybe find a good church. We have one more chapter to go. We hope that you'll be able to join us next week as we um, finish uh, Second Samuel. Um, Again, the Lord still wants to say something powerfully to you and show you many more things. So hopefully you can join us then. But until that day comes, until next week, I hope you have a great week. Stay safe. Um, 
just hold on to the Lord. Um, and we'll see you again next week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message this morning. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.